It is a great honor to introduce the Nobel Laureate in Literature, author Mu Yen. He is the recipient of the 2012 Nobel Prize for Literature. His work has been translated into over 20 languages, and he is revered by readers and filmmakers the world over. He has been hailed as a writer who, with hallucinatory realism, merges folk tales, history, and the contemporary. He is known as a writer of indigenous culture, and his work frequently uses bold primary colors of these indigenous cultures, such as those depicted in Zhang Yimou's film Red Sorghum, adapted from Mo Yan's book of the same title. Mo's winning the Nobel Prize has not only aroused interest in his work, but in Chinese literature as well. Since receiving the Nobel Prize in 2012, his books have seen an exponential surge not only in Chinese readership but also in foreign languages as well, pushing demand for translations of his work. According to the China's Writers Association, there are only about 2,000 translated contemporary Chinese titles on the global market. Wu Muoyan fever is surely drawing more world attention to Chinese literature. Is this all happening too fast? And is there something getting lost in translation? Well, we've been talking about translation. What do you think are the differences between your original work and the translations? And how do you look at the differences? And do you think that there's something to be gained, perhaps, in what's lost in translation? In a sense, loss is inevitable in the process of literary translation. For instance, it's always very difficult in cases of double entendre, and subtext where direct translation just doesn't work. So, in a way, it's also a process of selection. When there are multiple meanings in a novel or poems, usually only one is translated, and that's usually only translating the story. But the charm of the language and the art is lost. But that's just something we simply have to recognize work with, because that's how we can disseminate our culture, through translation. Yet good translators usually have remedies for this. They can use substitutions. For example, in my novel, Sandalwood Death, there are a lot of indigenous operas and opera venues. Also, the melody of these operas serves as a secondary narration to the work and has an implicit meaning. So, how do you translate something like this? Well, there was one Japanese translator who translated my novel, Sandalwood Death, and he found a substitute. That substitute was local opera, tunes from his hometown. He used his experience from listening to and singing these local tunes to help substitute for those in the original work. So. Even though what's being conveyed to the reader is no longer my Mao Qian, the local tunes from my hometown, he was able to more accurately translate the essence of the novel. As for the translation of poems, it's probably more challenging. At least with novels, there is the story that you can rely on. At any rate, translation can be frustrating, but we also can't expand without it. There are good translators around, and they're able to convey the basic style of the author. I think if 70 to 80 percent can be conveyed, that's a good translation. When I'm reading translated work, I always think about and mull over what might not be translated, from my experience as an author. At the beginning of the 1980s, I used to read a lot of Latin American literature, such as works of Garcia Marcos, American literature such as William Faulkner's works, and Japanese literature as well. And I thought a lot about the translation, because the story was not so important to me. But the language of these translated novels is the voice of the Chinese translators. But of course, good translators can make use of their set of skills to convey the style of the author to the reader to some extent. Yet much of the personality of the writer is hidden in the translation. 
but you can still feel it. So this is maybe how I might differ as a professional reader from an everyday reader. What also sets him apart is Moyen's life, from which he has drawn much of his inspiration for his writing. As in the case of William Faulkner, Moyen actually grew up in the fictionalized northeast town of Gaomi County. Moyen's adolescence coincided with China's opening up and social reform. Foreign literature and art flooded into China, giving Mo a fresh and critical perspective on the native culture with which he closely identifies. In 1986, Mo Yan published his first novel, Red Sorghum, set in his native Shandong province. The novel centers around family struggles of three generations of sorghum distillers embroiled in the Chinese war of resistance against Japanese aggression. The novel immediately led to Zhang Yimou's famous directorial debut, the film Red Sorghum, which received wide international acclaim and a Golden Bear Award at the 1999 Berlin Film Festival. Now with the Nobel Prize behind the story's original author, a new TV adaptation of Red Sorghum is also slated for release in China. This comes in the wake of a deluge of low-budget TV series taking advantage of generous broadcasting policies for patriotic content. So will a more reverent original story break the cycle? In recent years, there's been way too many TV dramas perhaps about anti-Japanese occupation. And some of them are more exaggerated or fictionalized than others, perhaps. But the TV drama based on your story, The Red Sorghum, has received a lot of attention even before it's released. So how is this one different from the other ones? I was involved in the early stages of the screenplay writing process. I oversaw two writers, and together we drafted a treatment, and another playwright took over from then on. I saw the final treatment, but not the screenplay. I don't think it's over-exaggerated. If in the final product you'll see someone gunning down three Japanese soldiers from one shot, but I highly doubt it. But I think those hyperbolized anti-Japanese films are a style and hallucinatory style as well, if we'd like to be more embracive. So you can't watch it and expect it to be all real, or watch it with a realist attitude. First of all, the Japanese soldiers then weren't that weak, and the weapons of the Chinese soldiers weren't that high-tech. The Chinese army was not full of snipers. Since these TV dramas have already become work of art, then there's no need to ask too much from them in terms of realism. As for this TV series adapted from my work, Japanese resistance is simply the historical background. Most of my work is done on fleshing out the humanity, humanity in extreme cases where they're called into question and put to trial, as well as emotions and fate. It's actually very classical. I used to watch a lot of movies when I was at school in the 1980s. I was taken over by the strong visual assault of the images. The use of montage and temporal eclipses also influenced my novels, because before we were used to a linear chronology in our writing, but film is different. Many of my novels, including The Red Sorghum Clan, which even though is a historical novel, doesn't follow a linear chronology. I learned a lot from film and montage. For someone whose work is so vested in tradition, Moyen found his answer to success by also breaking with tradition, by embracing other art forms and cultures. It's no surprise, as Moyen says, Chinese literature is now an important part of world literature. Julian Wakan, CCTV.